Hello, this is Angelia, and you are listening to or watching the podcast, Why You Do What You Do. The podcast that talks about human development and psychology to help you figure out maybe a little bit more about why you do what you do. Um, and last time we were talking about the seventh stage of moral reasoning. Um, and this time we're going to talk about gender and moral development. Uh, does it make a difference? Yeah, a little bit. Carol Gilligan, and she was a scientist, Gilligan suggested that a woman's central moral dilemma is the conflict between her own needs and those of others. So, as women, I'm getting a little more room here, uh, we are taught that our job is to take care of others. So, our moral dilemma is, how do we get our needs met And yet we still have to take care of others. That's the problem for women. (laughs) While most societies typically expect assertiveness and independent judgment from men, they expect from women self-sacrifice and concern for others. So they expect the opposite from women that they expect from men. So this has been a problem uh, since the Industrial Revolution. When women started going out and working and making uh, life. And then uh, people were like, oh, she's a bee-yaw because she's acting like a man. Uh, But yet she's in a position just like a man, so she has to be doing the things a man does. So it's become an identity crisis for women. (laughs) Whereas we all should, in theory, be equal. We're still held to the same standards we were when men were out working and women were in the home you know so not only do we are we expected to work and make money to help the household we're expected to take care of the household and the guys are relegated to the yard work once a week so (laughs) it's still a little unfair for the ladies just that's a fact to find out how women make moral choices Gilligan interviewed 29 pregnant women about their decisions to continue or end their pregnancies. Um, And of course, you know, that's a very narrow uh, field of, you know, moral dilemma uh, that really, in my opinion, wouldn't really play over into everything else in life, honestly. These women saw morality in terms of selfishness versus responsibility, defined as an obligation to exercise care and to avoid hurting others. So... You know, she started acting, uh, talking to these women about this, and this is what they came up with. Gilligan concluded that women think less about abstract justice and fairness than men do, and more about their responsibility to specific people. So women actually think more about their responsibilities to specific people than men do. And ladies, unfortunately, this is why your man is never going to be as good to you as you are to him. (laughs) because he just don't think about it and that's a fact it's a rare man who is as thoughtful as a woman and trust me we would all love that if they were (laughs) just sorry fellas that's just you know a thing (coughs) however other research has not on the whole found significant gender differences in moral reasoning so This lady was probably looking for the specifics, whereas other studies have not. And in general, there's not a whole lot of difference between men and women on morality. One large-scale analysis comparing results from 66 studies found no significant difference in men's and women's responses to Kohlberg's dilemma across the lifespan. So if you go back and remember about that, about the drugs, just steal the cancer drug because the druggist is charging, you know, a hundred times more than what it costs him, and, you know, but in general, men and women still are about the same on these uh, moral decisions. In studies using real-life moral dilemmas, such as whether a woman's lover should confess their affair to her husband, rather than hypothetical dilemmas like the ones Kohlberg and Gilligan used, uh, a narrow moral logic and become more able to well, 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 good god let me, let me start this over uh, hypothetical dilemmas like Coburg, Gilligan and her colleagues found that many people in their 20s 
became dissatisfied with a narrow moral logic and became more able to live with moral contradictions. So our young folks in their 20s, um, even though they're adults, their thinking, remember when we were talking about this earlier, their thinking is not fully mature yet. So they will justify their decisions that maybe aren't necessarily moral because it's what I want to do. They're still a little bit impulsive. So people in their 20s are still not really super moral, sorry guys, uh, because they're still a little impulsive and their morality is still flexible. <laughs> Both theories now place responsibility to others at the highest level of moral thought. And that is, um, you need to make wise choices for yourself and others. Uh, use critical thinking and common sense um, <clears throat> so that you can make wise choices uh, for yourself and others because your actions do affect other people. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and, um, you know, we want to have a positive impact on people, not a negative one. <coughs> both recognize the importance for both sexes of connections with other people and of compassion and care. So again, you know, I know people like that. There are men who are only nice to other men. There are women who are only nice to other women. Um, and that shouldn't be a thing. You should be equally nice to both sexes. You should be, <coughs> excuse me, equally nice to everyone, no matter what their sex, race, color, creed, etc. is. <coughs> and all people deserve compassion and care. You know, when you can put yourself in another person's shoes, then you can have a little more compassion for why they are the way they are. Um, and you can care about people. You know, there are people I know, they don't care a poop about other people at all. Um, it's all about them. And that's, like I say, very selfish, narcissistic, sociopathic. It's not good. You know. Development of faith across the lifespan. Oh, you didn't know we were going to talk about faith in psychology class? Oh, yeah, we did. <laughs> because faith can be a compass. That can guide your life. And it does affect the way you think. <clears throat> can faith be studied from a developmental perspective? Yes. According to James Fowler. Fowler defined faith as a way of seeing or knowing the world. So faith can be a way, uh, a lens through how you see the world. <clears throat> to find out how people arrive at this knowledge... Fowler and his students at Harvard U Divinity School interviewed more than 400 people of all ages with various ethnic, educational, and socioeconomic backgrounds and various religions or secular identifications and affiliations. So they didn't just study their one little group of folks. They started studying <coughs> a bunch of different people with beliefs, different beliefs. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, <coughs> I'm having an allergy issue today. Fowler's theory focuses on the form of faith, not its content or object. It is not limited to any particular belief system. So his study was strictly about faith, not about which faith. <laughs> faith can be religious or non-religious. And some people don't think about that. You might have faith, you know, that this is going to work and faith in something and it doesn't have to be religious. People may have faith in a god, in science, in humanity, or in a cause to which they attach ultimate worth and which gives meaning to their lives. So, you know, it doesn't all have to be about that religion. It, it can also be about, you know, ideals. Um, now, again, um, I have faith in science as well, as long as it's used in a good way and we're not creating monsters and things like that, which would be stupid. <laughs> you know, and faith in humanity. I like to believe that people are basically good, but unfortunately, here in this country especially, um, there have been a lot of bad leaders who have brought badness out in people. Um, and, I mean, leaders are supposed to lead by example. If you are leading and teaching people, it's okay to be a sexist, racist jerk um, and selfish, uh, that's not good to be teaching your people, is it? Because then everybody's going to be a sexist, racist, selfish jerk. And what kind of country are you going to have? A garbage country. 
That's all I know. But anything they attach meaning to, that gives meaning to their life. And that could be considered a faith, even if it's not a religious faith. According to Fowler, faith develops, as do other aspects of cognitive, uh, through interactions, cognition, my goodness, today, it's one of them days, my tongue is crazy, people, between the maturing person and the environment. So, again, um, when you interact with your environment, it matures you. It matures your mind, your uh, spirit, your heart, your uh, soul, your body, everything. When you have experiences, it grows you. As in other stage theories, Fowler's stages of faith progress in an unvarying sequence, each building on those that went before. New experiences, such as crises, problems, or revelations, that challenge or upset a person's equilibrium may prompt a leap from one stage to the next. Um, because differences of opinion and differences, you know, <laughs> of outlook are a fact of life. Everyone in every culture, there's going to be differences. Um, and that's just the way it is, you know. And if you come across a belief that is not a belief you hold, it does kind of upset you. Um, but it can also be a point for growth because you realize that everybody doesn't see things the way you see things. Everybody has their own unique self, their own unique point of view, their own unique life experience, which led them to their point, just as yours led you to your point. So learning that about others can help you grow socially. The ages at which these transitions occur are variable, and some people never leave a particular stage, and that's because they don't experience life. They keep themselves, you know, to a certain level, and that's where they're happy. They don't want to go and learn anymore. They're happy where they are, you know. I call that ignorant because that, you know, you should want to learn all you can about all you can. That's my opinion on that, you know. After children become self-aware, they begin to use language and symbolic thought and have developed what Erickson called basic trust. The sense that their needs will be met by powerful others. And then in the beginning, that's your parents. Um, and then later on, that might be, you know, uh, teachers at school, um, deans at universities, and, you know, your spouse, and on and on. Stage 1, Intuitive Projective Faith. As young children struggle to understand the forces that control their world, they form powerful, imaginative, often terrifying, and sometimes lasting images of God, heaven, and hell, drawn from the stories adults read to them. So that's how all kids learn. I remember my dad uh, started teaching us, you know, when I was a little uh, toddler, uh, would read that, I'm sure we all had that white children's Bible <laughs> with the stories and the colorful pictures. Um, and he would read that. Um, and he even made, because uh, I asked him one time, I had Play-Doh out, and, and what would the devil look like? And So he made this red clay sculpture of the devil with horns and a beard and all that. And, you know, we thought that was pretty scary. I think I, think I was like maybe four, so my brother was only like two. So to us, pretty scary. Um, these images are often irrational since pre-operational children tend to be confused about cause and effect and may have trouble distinguishing between reality and fantasy. So, you know, what they think in their mind, um, they have problems knowing that that's not actually how it is, that that's not reality just because it's something they imagine. Still egocentric they have difficulty distinguishing God's point of view from their own or their parents'. So, in their mind, God's exactly like them. <laughs> they think of God mainly in terms of obedience and punishment. Uh, because that's all, you know, that's in their brain. God is, that's, you obey God or you get punished. <laughs> Stage two, mythic literal faith. Children are now more logical and begin to develop a more coherent view of the universe. 
slowly start to think of, you know, things a little more sensibly. Not yet capable of abstract thought, they tend to take religious stories and symbols literally as they adopt their families and communities' beliefs and observances. So, you know, they're fully indoctrinated. They believe everything because, you know, that's what they know. They can now see God as having a perspective beyond their own, which takes into account people's effort and intent. Because they feel like God knows everything, sees anything. He's going to know what you mean. He's going to know, you know, what your intentions were. They believe that God is fair and that people will get what they deserve. So, very innocent, naive way of looking at things. Stage 3. Synthetic conventional faith. Adolescents, now capable of abstract thought, begin to form ideologies or belief systems and commitments to ideals. Um, if you remember back in high school, you, you did. You, there were things that you were like all for, things you were all against. As they search for identity, they seek a more personal relationship with God. Um, and some people never do. So some people never get to this point, you know. However, their identity is not on firm ground. They look to others, usually peers, for moral authority um, because they're not quite sure. Uh, they have these ideas, they have maybe a belief, um, but they're still wavering. <coughs> their faith is unquestioning and conforms to community standards. Um, so they are what they're used to. Like, if you're in a certain church, you believe the way that they believe. Um, because that's what you're used to, um, and that's what your faith is. This stage is typical of followers of organized religion. About 50% of adults may never move beyond it. Um, and that's because they don't think anything else about it. They, this is my faith, this is what I grew up with, this is how I'm going to be, um, and I believe it 100%. And that's where they stay. Stage four, individuative reflective faith. Adults who reach this post-conventional stage examine their faith critically and think out their own beliefs, independent of external authority and group norms. And this is where a lot of people, you know, um, like monks and other people who go off and you know, like the Buddha did um, and think about, well, what is my faith? What do I believe in my faith? What do I maybe not believe that I don't have never admitted to anyone about my faith? Um, and then you start thinking about what you believe. Since young adults are deeply concerned with intimacy, movement into this stage is often triggered by divorce, death of a friend or parent, or some other stressful event. Um, and that can get people thinking about like, why does God let this happen? You know, this this was not cool. Stage 5. Conjunctive faith. Middle-aged people become more aware of the limits of reason. Because, like I say, the world is not black and white. You know? Uh, people want to make it that way, but it's not. There's shades of gray everywhere. There's always exceptions to the rules. They recognize life's paradoxes and contradictions. And they often struggle with conflicts between fulfilling their own needs and sacrificing for others. And that's a daily thing, you know, because like we were talking about for women earlier, you know, we have goals too. We have things we want to achieve in life. Um, so when the hubby comes home and says, you know, something about dirty dishes in the sink, you just want to punch him in the face, honestly. But you don't do that. You're just like, I'll get to it. You know, I was doing uh, things today. I was working on this or that, you know. Because, uh, you know, even if you're at home and, and you're working from home, that work is important to you. Or you wouldn't be bothering, you know. So, you know, even though he had a hard day at work and worked a long day at work doing other stuff, um, no offense, but the dish that you didn't even rinse out well, you know, uh, that you could have, you know. <laughs> wasn't my top priority today. <laughs> As they begin to anticipate death, 
they may achieve a deeper understanding and acceptance by integrating into their faith aspects of their earlier beliefs. So they question the faith, they examine the faith, and then they might go back to how they were before. But, you know, in this stage of faith, um, it's all about, you know, connecting everything and consolidating everything. You know, this is what I believe, this is what I can live without. Um, I grew up, you know, in a Catholic church and, you know, uh, there are things I believe and there were things I don't. So I can't be a Catholic because if I were a Catholic, I'd have to believe all this stuff that I don't. So, you know, um, I've been other denominations, um, and now I'm, uh, interdenominational. You know, I'm a, um, Unitarian, you know, Universalist, and, um, so I believe that we don't all have it known, that God knows way more than we know, um, and Gandhi, I believe, said that if everyone thinks they're right, nobody can be. So, there's more than we know, and I'm going on that, you know, <laughs> there are things I believe, and things I don't believe, and that's just me. <laughs> Stage 6. Universalizing Faith In this rare, ultimate category, Fowler placed such moral and spiritual leaders as Mahatma Gandhi, Martin Luther King, and Mother Teresa, whose breadth of vision and commitment to the well-being of all humanity profoundly inspires others. And those are the people who inspire me. The, the people who kind of got it and understood it's not all about you, it's about all of us. We need to make the world better for all of us, for our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren. Consumed with a sense of participation and a power that unifies and transforms the world, they seem more lucid, more simple, and yet somehow more fully human than the rest of us. Um, and, you know, that, those are the kind of people you look, to, look up to, you know, these, these good people that get it, you know, that realize and even go above and beyond what we can, we can ourselves do most of the time. Because they threaten the established order, they often become martyrs because the established order doesn't like it when you threaten them. And though they love life, they do not cling to it because, you know, people understand. I understand when I come on here, there's going to be some people who I'm probably going to be unpopular with because I'm telling them things that they might not like. <laughs> they might not want to hear it. They might not believe it based on what their beliefs are. <coughs> so I understand that. <coughs> I don't expect anybody to, you know, uh, uh, martyr me because of it. Thank goodness, hopefully. <laughs> but um, I understand that if you speak out on things, you're going to be unpopular with somebody. This stage parallels Kohlberg's proposed seventh stage of moral development. So, moral development and faith development kind of ride along with each other. <coughs> My goodness. Oh. As one of the first researchers to systematically study how faith develops, Fowler has had great impact. His work has become required reading in many divinity schools. So, you know, if you go to divinity school, um, you will probably have to read about Fowler and his research. Older people at intermediate levels of faith develop, development were less likely to be depressed than older people at higher or lower stages. So, you know, uh, older people who are happy with their faith, um, are happier in general. <coughs> <coughs> My goodness. Hmm. Education and work. Educational and vocational choices after high school flow from the cognitive developments of earlier years and often present opportunities <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> oh, I'm having a bad allergy for further cognitive growth. So, when you go out into the world, and you're going to college, or you're going, you know, to work ready, um, it's building upon the education you got before that. A transition to college. 
College enrollment is at a record high and is still growing, in part because of older women going back to school. And I went back to school when I was in my 30s. I think I was 34 years old when I went back to college. So, you know, there are a lot of older women going back to school. And like I said, for eight of the years, I was a single mom. So, it took me a lot longer. It took me 13 years <laughs> to get through, <laughs> to get my uh, PhD. <laughs> because where I live, um, you can't get a license or anything when you go to outside schools um so i knew i could not become a licensed psychologist i could however become a psychological consultant and that's what i did um and that's basically what i'm still doing right here <laughs> with you uh, teaching you guys this stuff uh, you're getting it for free my students had to pay back in the day you know <laughs> so <laughs> you yeah, know um so if you know you want to go on patreon and kick me a little bit that's cool too <laughs> you know trying to still make a life here <clears throat> today nearly all graduating high school students plan to continue their education at some point and nearly two out of three go directly to college as compared with only about one in two in 1972 so now kids are going to college you know we've got the Pell Grants we've got the Stafford loans you know it's it, easier on them to go and then you know have to start paying later on deferred you know until they start getting a job and stuff 1972 wasn't like that so people who had the money went back then so times have changed for the better for our kids in the 1970s women were less likely than men to go to college and less likely to finish um, that's straight up because back in the day once you became a mom that was it that was your job um and you know my mom was kind of a uh, uh rule breaker because when she became a single mom um she went back to school to study bookkeeping um and then she went to work you know and she was a single mom so she was doing that and raising us now we did have babysitters and we did stay at different places that had not so great outcomes <laughs> sometimes but she was doing what she thought was best for her family. <coughs> Today, women earn more than half of all bachelor's degrees. So, you know, women have caught up with the men. However, women still tend to major in traditionally feminine fields, such as education, nursing, and psychology. The great majority of engineering and computer science degrees still go to men but the gender gap has reversed in life sciences and is closing in mathematics and physical sciences because of stem s-t-e-m classes in grade schools <coughs> and now all the schools my sons went to had that and you know they're trying to get girls you know care more about science technology you know and math so Socioeconomic status plays a major role in access to post-secondary education. <coughs> and that's because if you got the money, you're more likely to go. In 1999, 76% of high school graduates from high-income families, as compared with only 49% from low-income families, enrolled immediately in college. Um, and now I know um, I had to go distance studies. I had to go to school online because... Our local colleges were too expensive you know I, had, I checked into one of them and I was gonna have to pay like a $300 a month payment you know at my age um, and it's like no I, I'm a single mom you know with these kids I can't afford this kind of payment to go back to school so I couldn't get an education from local schools I had to do it distance learning you know so that hurt me but I still got the education um, and I still was able to use it with my students and my clients so it achieved what I wanted it to achieve in the long run. <laughs> A majority of undergraduate students attend four-year degree granting into institutions and most of these, oh excuse me, who complete their first year go on to earn degrees. Um, that's the teller year. Um, I had a son with school first year. He basically didn't go that 
second half of the first year. He was there, but he didn't go. He was just sitting there hanging out, eating the food that his, you know, uh, grandmother paid for, using the phone cards that we paid for and everything, and just having a gay old time down there at college and not bothering to actually study and do his work. So, you know, the, the first year is the teller. If they can get this through the first year, um, and he actually felt so bad about that, he went back to school and got a um, career diploma in environmental sciences and conservation. You know, so, you know, it, it, it's, it's hard to get through the first year, they say. Uh, however, enrollment patterns have shifted since 1970. Increasing numbers of students attend college part-time or go to two-year community colleges. And one of my sons went to our local community college and then went to the university um, and got his degree. Uh, he started out in sports medicine and then he kind of changed his mind and decided to go into business and so he got his business degree. So. In 1996, nearly half of all post-high school students who were not working towards bachelor's degrees were enrolled in vocational education, mostly in community colleges and chiefly in business, health, and engineering, and science technology. Now, one of my children, uh, we got him into a magnet school um, where they had a work-ready program. <coughs> he started out in uh, mechanics. But then he quickly realized, um, he was also in a tool and die thing, um, realized he liked that better. Um, and that's where, you know, he stayed. He did co-op his senior year, um, had a job, and they loved him and said he got a job for life if he wants it. Um, and, you know, he's ended up working in a good field, making good money since then. So, you know, my, my three kids have gone all three routes on that. So, you know. Uh, but they all got their education, they all have jobs, and they're doing well. So, you know, each kid is different, and each kid is going to have to do it the way they can do it. So, you know, if kids not doing so well in college, don't sweat it. They might go back later. They might get into a different program. They might decide to go into the service, you know. Um, it, it happens. I have a person in my family that didn't do so good and they went into the service and they ended up with a good job and everything and it worked out for them so don't be too rough on your kids if school's not their thing you know just make sure they're having the best outcome possible because that's your job as a parent and that's where I'm gonna leave you today um hope this help you figure out maybe a little bit more about why you do what you do um uh, please like and share this educational program so we can spread it around the world um, if you want to help me out, subscribe to my YouTube channel. If you want to help me out even more, go to my Patreon page and become a patron. That's all for now. Until next time.